As I was growing up, we were in the midst of what some people refer to as the third industrial revolution. This was the age of the computer. And this was my uh, first computer. It's a, a ZX81. It was launched in March of 1981. And it was one of the first affordable home computers. It cost just 40 pounds, which in today's money is about $200. In that year, I persuaded my parents for my birthday to let me spend my life savings, I was eight, <laughs> on this computer. They didn't understand why I would want or need a computer. And to tell you the truth, yeah, neither did I. But they let me buy it. And for context, you couldn't play a game on a computer like this. You had to program it first. So that's what I learned to do. I learned to program. As an eight-year-old, I found it thrilling to be able to program and tell a computer what to do. Fast forward 30-something years. Guess what? I work in computers. I also work in the area of artificial intelligence. And right now, we are standing on the threshold of another industrial revolution, the fourth. The third, it was all about computers and the internet. This fourth is gonna be characterized by ubiquitous technology and the widespread adoption of artificial intelligence. Now the narrative around AI is somewhat of a fearful one. We have science fiction to thank for some of this. Hal, the computer from the film 2001 Space Odyssey, you know, became a homicidal maniac. The Terminator movies taught us of the impending machine apocalypse, but there are also notable academics and pioneers who are telling us to pay attention to what's happening in AI. Elon Musk described AI as uh, mankind's greatest existential threat. He's quoted as saying in I think it was 2014, that with AI we are summoning the demon. And this opinion is shared by the likes of the late, great Stephen Hawking who said that the creation of a full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Now, this fear around AI, it stems from the thought that at some point, we're gonna create an artificial intelligence which is gonna exceed our own human cognitive capabilities. This crossover point when AI has become smarter than us is known as the AI singularity. At this point, it's thought that we will struggle to maintain control. Those of us that work in the industry are working hard to establish standards that will guide us in the creation of intelligent machines so we can do it safely and with respect for human rights, such as privacy. Now, I think we should be concerned about these, these fears of AI, but I think there are other things that are gonna happen as well, and they're gonna happen much more, much more quickly. With every technology revolution, it's changed our lives in some way. We've become more productive. Our lifespan has been expanded. But also, it's changed the kind of jobs that we do. So this uh, image is from a pattern that was filed in around about 1820. It's an agricultural threshing machine. At this point in time, the number of people who worked in agriculture in the United States was something like 90% of the population. Today, that number is just 3%. While agriculture is still very important to us, we need far fewer people to have the same impact. The displacement of people from agriculture took a long time, and there was plenty of time for new roles to be created, new work to be created, and for people to move into those roles. And I think most of us looking back would consider this to be progress, but there's something different about this AI revolution that's around us right now. There's two important differences. First, this one is gonna happen way more quickly than the last. But also, and perhaps more importantly, this revolution is going to impact roles not previously impacted. The likes of doctors, lawyers, accountants, and teachers. Many are concerned that they will be displaced or replaced by artificial intelligence. I think something else is much more desirable, and also perhaps more likely. I work in the area of intelligence augmentation with AI. By this, I mean an artificial intelligence working alongside a human in order to improve their, their abilities, in order to augment their capability. And with uh, intelligence augmentation, we can keep humans as being the center of this, of this picture. 
So is there any evidence that intelligence augmentation works? So let's take an example. In 2005, just right after Garry Kasparov was beaten by uh, Deep Blue, which was the IBM chess computer, a new form of chess tournament was created, and it was called Centaur Chess. In Centaur Chess, teams play on both sides against each other. But what's interesting about those teams is that they were made up of human and AIs working together. Now, it should come as no surprise that an AI will beat a human at chess. But what may be surprising to you is that an AI human working together as a team will beat an AI alone. So you see, human augmentation wins in this case. Let's look at another example. Recently, an artificial intelligence called AlphaGo beat Lee Sedol at the game of Go. He's a Go master. Go is an ancient Chinese board game developed about 2,500 years ago. And while the rules of the game are very simple, playing the game is highly complex. In fact, the number of combinations of positions on a Go board is greater than the number of atoms in the universe. So after Lee had played AlphaGo at the game of Go and lost, he went on to have a two-month winning streak, something very unusual. And when he was playing AlphaGo, it was noted that the AI seemed to have unique strategies, moves that it had created all of itself. Another Go master at the time said, Go is not as simple as we thought. There's still huge room for we humans to explore. Now think about that just for a moment. An AI taught us something new about a game that we had been playing for two millennia. What this implies is that by working with AI, we can learn new things. It can help us to shed our human bias and look at problems in a new way. I don't know about you, but I am thrilled to think about what we might discover by actually working with AI, what it could unlock. So is there examples of uh, human augmentation with AI outside uh, of, of games? Well, let's take the example of financial audit. I think it's probably fair to say that most, most of us don't enjoy the prospect of being audited. But let's step back for a moment. Let's look at it from the perspective uh, of the auditor. Auditors are tasked uh, with finding irregularities in financial data. It's often a very detail-oriented and laborious task. And if they fail to uncover something material, they can get into trouble. Now, the real problem uh, with auditing is the fact that the amount of data involved is so large. There are too many transactions in, a, in, a given, in an organization for a human being to be able to look at all of them. It would cost too much and it would take too long for a human being to do that. To combat this, the auditing profession has established uh, a practice of sampling. And in sampling, they take a small, randomly selected sample of transactions. And if they don't find the irregularities in the sample, they argue that likely the rest of the transactions are fine. A good friend of mine went into audit, and I always remember him telling me about a story about when he went to a warehouse to do an inventory audit, and he had to count nails. Sounds a little bit laborious, I think. And the reason I like this analogy of, of, of counting nails in audit is that finding irregularities in financial data, it's a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. But perhaps in the big data world, we can view that as finding an unusual nail in a warehouse full of nails. This idea of sampling, it's like taking a handful of nails and saying, is there anything unusual in here? And what's your chance of finding irregularity? Well, you might get lucky. Now, imagine that same process, but augmented with artificial intelligence. Where I work at MindBridge, we've developed the world's first AI auditor, and it looks at every transaction, every nail in the warehouse. It looks through everything, and it finds those transactions that are unusual, and it surfaces them to the human auditor. So you see the AI is working alongside the human, uh, finding those insights for them, so that the human can then take the following on steps, make the decisions. The interesting point here is the AI is compensating for the problem of there being big data. What this means is that audits can be faster and more complete than ever before. And I think that's good for everybody, except maybe fraudsters. <laughs> now, along the way, building our AI on Twitter, we learned some important lessons. We learned that if a professional is going to rely on an artificial intelligence, the AI has to be understandable and explainable. It's not acceptable 
for the AI to be a black box, computer says no sort of scenario. It has to be understandable, it's critical. Because here's the point, in human-centric AI, we are not ceding our decision-making to machines, we're using these artificial intelligence to improve our own abilities, to help us find new insights. And here's my important point. We could decide to fear AI, to ignore it or focus on the negatives, or we could decide to engage with it, to see what we can learn. The thing about human-centric AI is that it only works if humans are at the center of it. This fourth industrial revolution, it's happening all around us right now. And now is the time, now is our opportunity to engage with it, to help shape the future, and to make sure it remains human-centric. Thank you very much.